trying to get out of the comfort zone because these people aren't playing games. We're going to organize. Humanity's going to come together. We are swinging muskets here, toe-to-toe -to -toe with the globalists. They're bloodied. We're bloodied. It is absolute total war. It is Thursday, the 19th day of April, 2012. It's another edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Coming up after the main news segment, we're going to do an in-depth hour-plus interview with preparedness expert Joel Skousen, dealing with his book, Strategic Relocation in North America, third edition. This will definitely be some life-saving information and is for hardcore preppers who actually want to be prepared, not just have a big bucket of flashlights and batteries and firearms. So that is coming up. But first, let's jump right into our top story. Red alert. Draconian CISPA bill picking up sponsors ahead of vote next week. It's got over 100 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives and all the major internet watchdog groups are on record saying this is some of the most draconian anti-internet legislation they have ever seen. Meanwhile, speaking of internet, rights group demands investigation into Google wiretapping and Street View. Now, the government, I told you, if you're going to start this investigation, is just doing it to look like on the surface they care about Google trampling on people's rights. Google itself is a division of the CIA funded by NQTEL and using NSA technology. And Street View is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, they are involved with the onboard cameras and microphones on your computers with AI systems recording everything going on in your home. And how do we know this? Because they admit they have the software and are doing it. But they say it's okay at computers listening to you. All of this beyond 1984. Speaking of cars and wiretapping, in 1997 under federal regulations, not law, all of the new cars have boxes that track where you go, what you do, how fast you were driving. Um, that was all the U.S. made cars. By 2001, it was all foreign cars. Now they want it to where it has audio, live time feed, and you pay for it. You pay for the NSA Trojan horse system when you buy the car, all of that is piggybacked into it, just like the cell phones and the toasters and the microwave ovens that General Petraeus says is uh, watching you. But if you don't like it, you're still a conspiracy theorist. Those of us that didn't trust the corrupt uh, technocracy were always the bad conspiracy theorists for questioning known liars. Now it's all admitted, but we're, we're still bad. Shifting gears into the brighter side, Congressman Ron Paul's son, Senator Rand Paul, has come out and pointed out that Interpol is trying to do deals with the U.S. to extradite Americans, not under U.S. law and extradition agreements, but to extradite us under foreign law. And at the Durban, South Africa meeting a few months ago, the U.N. said that if you disagree with man-made global warming and don't want to pay your money to Al Gore and Rothschild, you should be arrested, and Interpol will come snatch you off the street, put a bag over your head, and throw on a rendition flight that flew into the U.S. bringing in opium that they delivered to us and fly you out to a torture site overseas. That'll teach you to not talk bad about Lord Rothschild. That's a big news-making interview. And one other part of our big interview exclusive with Senator Rand Paul uh, yesterday. Rand Paul leaves the door open for BP slot. Vice President position would give Senator an influence on the direction the country goes, quote, Paul was included on a short list of 10 possible candidates to become Mitt Romney's running mate by the Washington Post earlier this week. Speculation that Rand or his father, Congressman Ron Paul, would be in line for the VP slot has circulated for months. And then that opens up a larger debate here. The fact that the system would even debate trying to get them into their system shows that people are waking up Liberty's popular. So is it a co-op to even discuss it? Or is it good to leave the door open and talk about having that type of influence for constitutional issues? All I know is Rand Paul has a great voting record. We'll ask Joel Skousen coming up what he thinks about that 
uh, later in the transmission this evening, but a big story at InfoWars.com. Continuing here, it's been two years since the Gulf oil spill uh, took place, and we have seen massive fish die-offs, uh, death in many areas of the Gulf uh, with the flora and fauna living in the sea. And we've seen a lot of problems in the coastal regions with continual die-off, not just of plants, uh, but also animals. But now Al Jazeera is reporting on major studies in the United States showing huge increases in deformities uh, in all sorts of different life forms, crustaceans, uh, amphibians, uh, fish. And of course, the bigger disaster in all of this is that the crude oil itself is not that toxic. The core exit they used tens of millions of gallons on to make it sink to the bottom was far more toxic and has been connected to these problems. Speaking of deformities in fish, we're seeing massive deformity increases in humans and birth defects are skyrocketing all across the world. Uh, we're seeing three to four fold increases in U.S. troops having deformed children, 14 times increase in Fallujah where they use depleted uranium, shows the madness of the global elite taking the toxic waste of nuclear weapons development and uh, putting it into weapon systems. Uh, but there's a, a story in USA Today, girl born with no hands wins National Penmanship Award for her beautiful uh, writing. And it just shows that even though the globalists are attacking humanity uh, and uh, increasing pediatric cancers by more than 10,000%, uh, the human spirit will continue to prevail against uh, their most vicious attacks. So a positive story, a a silver lining in an otherwise very, very bleak situation. Speaking of people uh, who saw off the population's legs, economically, physically, spiritually, and then offer us their tyrannical crutches, Queen Beatrix, whose father was a Nazi and founded the World Wildlife Eugenics Fund, um, Queen Beatrix's brother-in-law calls for mandatory birth control for the unfit. And what's happening now is all the eugenicists have gotten together and they've all come out in mass and said, yes, we want one-child policies. Yes, we want to kill the infirm. Yes, we want world government. Uh, there's you know, a coming out uh, call for this after Hitler discredited uh, what they were up to. He said, people will accuse me of going too far, but to be honest, that's an easy thing to say if you do not know the facts. My eyes have been opened by seeing the problems. You're a big, rich guy living off state money and want everybody else dead. I got it. They came as a shock. You can see that these parents need help since they have no control over their own lives. When it's clear that's the case, perhaps contraception should be the best step. And in a way, that's even true. But it's the state that created the nanny state in a plan to destroy families and make us dependent. So off your legs, offer you a pair of crutches. Speaking of the devil, eugenics, if there is a devil alive on this earth walking on two spindly legs, uh, who looks like Ichabod Crane of the Headless Horseman tale of Sleepy Hollow, it is Bill Gates. And we noticed a trend about four years ago in major newspapers, TV, ABC, you name it, of Bill Gates. He's Superman. He's, he's the Fantastic Four. He's Green Lantern. He's a hero. He wants to get vaccines into you because he cares about you. And all the documents where he admits he wants to sterilize you or kill you. And then we started discovering, we've done reports on this, Aaron Dykes has one up today, comic book hero crafting the image of eugenicist Bill Gates as a lifesaver. Now that's Aaron's headline. I told him to go with the headline. This is what this really is. Bill Gates pays media to say he's a superhero. I mean, that's how cheesy this is. ABC News, London Guardian, look at Aaron's article. Hundreds of publications, dozens of TV networks worldwide are paid. It'll actually say in the footnote, Bill Gates paid for this. It's product placement, propaganda, and now they're coming out with comic books about how he's the savior of Earth. This is a guy that says, you kill grandma, you hire 10 people. The teachers are like, ah, in the meeting, murder. I mean, that video is online. Type in Bill Gates endorses death panels. I played it 30-something times, won't play it again tonight. And I mean, he's just selling you on an implosion economy instead of a win-win economy. I mean, Bill Gates is a monster of galactic proportions. So get the story out. Comic book hero crafting the image of eugenicist Bill Gates as a lifesaver. But the executive headline that I would give it is, Bill Gates 
Scandal. Scandal. Colon. Bill Gates pays media to say he's a superhero. Does it get any more pathetic? Perhaps when this TV show goes up on YouTube, we'll actually give it the headline I had. But great job, Aaron, putting that story together. Continuing here, ladies and gentlemen, redefining action hero. Why TV shows compare him to Batman. That's what Jon Stewart said. There's no hero like Bill Gates. Batman. So everybody knows if the corporate media tells you something, it, it must be true. Continuing here, let's talk about real environmental threats. I want to show viewers a document cam shot because Earth Day is coming up. And this is the Austin Chronicle dedicated to uh, globalism, deception, fake liberal, neoconnery, and every other form of deception you can imagine. Uh, pinning dozens and dozens of fake hit pieces against me. Just check it out for yourself. Uh, in the last 15 years, they had their eye on me for a long time. This establishment propaganda outfit that puts on South by Southwest, where they scam all the trendies to come here thinking they're going to be big stars. Uh, Lewis uh, Black, that's his stage name. Uh, it says, Earth, fun while it lasted. And then you can read about, give up all your rights to Al Gore, and uh, he will uh, he will save you. He will take good care of you. And it's in, it's all about how wonderful Walter Cronkite, the eugenicist, who openly uh, said that he was for population reduction. Okay, well then, Walter, you're dead now. You're off the planet. So all you that endorse this commit suicide. The point is that they're always selling you on fake environmental threats. The, the oxygen uh, that plants let off is evil. The carbon dioxide we exhale in the carbon cycle with plants is bad because they can tax us and make us the bad guy. Not open air genetic engineering, cross species pollination, pharmacological crops that produce pesticide within them so the bugs can't eat them and die. So Monsanto demands that they plant refuge corn, in one case we covered, so that the bugs have something to eat because it's wiping out all the bugs and birds if they eat the stuff we eat. That's the real threat. Fish infusion, nuclear weapons, all this type of stuff, not humans. So the establishment can pose as saviors and say, you know, the uh, earth, it was good while it lasted. Here's an article uh, at Infowars.com. Blamed for bee collapse, Monsanto buys leading bee research firm. In fact, Biologics Company Information states the primary goal of the firm is to study the very collapse disorder that is thought to result, at least in part, of Monsanto's own creations. That's what their studies show. But don't worry, now Monsanto has come in and bought it up. Folks, German studies seven, eight years ago showed it was this one type of BT corn doing it. And there's a bunch of others. Look, the bugs eat it, they die, but they feed it to you. And they go, well, it's a naturally occurring pesticide. They've got a bacterial one, they've got a fungal one. They boost it on average over 1,000 times what the fungus naturally occurs in the environment. Same thing with the bacterial codoxin. So, so yeah, the, some of these plants can have a natural fungus that keeps bugs off of them, but you have the plant grow it itself and then we eat it. All the studies show, organ failure, you name it. So why don't you, Austin Chronicle lectures about how you're high and mighty, have the moral high ground. You know what, you're a bunch of fakes and I'm sick of it. Hey. Your kids will get the organ failure. You'll get the cancer early. So roll your sleeves up. Take the vaccines. Just, just, just laugh at me. You'll be judged by your own evil. I'm risking my life to cover real issues. You know, Earth was incredible while it lasted. We hope to save it and deal with real environmental crises that your fake environmental movement distracts from. That's another thing this is all about. While the globalists say anything is natural because we're human, so if we make something, it's a natural mutation, let's rewrite the whole planet. Let's take control of evolution, as they say in their own words. Let's play God. Funny, the eugenicist of the British royal family and five other families in the 1850s started interbreeding to create the Superman, they thought, and all it did was create monsters. So... I don't want to keep following some crazed dream set in motion by British royalty 160 something years ago that's proven to be a complete fraud. I want off the roller coaster, off this road. You people are good at screwing over society, robbing people. But that doesn't mean you're dominant. That's like cancer. It's able to take over, but it kills the host. You're on the wrong path. Change it now. You're going to destroy yourselves. Just to get a bunch of cowards to follow you doesn't mean you're in the right. Continuing here, 
A man who said he was fed up with being harassed by airport security stripped down to his birthday suit, and they arrested him, saying it was improper. But it's okay to have the pervs at TSA groping your genitals and taking naked body shots of you and groping movie stars and asking them out for dates. But when you point out that they're essentially violating your rights and take the power back by stripping down, they arrest you. By the way, Marcos Morales and Darren McBreen have an incredible story from when they flew out of Austin to, to cover the murder of the man for his land in Georgia. They hadn't even told me yet, and I was telling the story again of a TSA guy doing a grope down on me and, 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 and actually salivating. I mean, I, I'd never experienced in my life a man putting his hands on me and, 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 and getting sexually excited. And they were like, oh, that happened to us. And, and the TSA guy put his glove on in Austin and said, it's pleasure time, and popped the glove. So that's the only, and, and, and then, because they opted out, they made him wait and kept laughing at him. I mean, folks, we'll, we'll tell the story tomorrow, but I mean, <laughs> but you take the power back, and it, but look, they're enjoying it there. And it's like, whatever your fancy is, like that famous model said the woman was hitting on her while she was grabbing her genitals and all that. I mean, that just happened. I mean, this is it. I mean, this is it. Who would take the job to do this? This is total social engineering. Uh, finally tonight, before we go to break, young Americans turn away from driving. And the Financial Times reports that thanks to the economy being shut down, they say the carbon taxes and all this are meant to teach us not to drive cars. Young people on record droves aren't buying cars. The paramount symbol of independence and Americana is gone with Facebook and iPhones. No more mobility. They're taking the good mass transit where they can be groped by the TSA, now running checkpoints there. The army of pedophile rapists, that Amer a land of the pedophile rapist, home of the abused slave. Thought it was land free, home of the brave, but it's now a land of the uh, pedophile rapist scam artist and child pedophile services. Uh, continuing uh, here, uh, after we've gone over that report, Killing the American Dream, sex bots. And do, I mean, do they really think we believe this is going to replace sex, a, a rubber woman? I mean, is that a joke? Do people really use those sex dolls? I've, I've seen them on TV where they have like a little, some, even some hair and everything. Uh, me, I'll uh, take the real thing, uh, the, uh, the uh, real deal. You can, I mean, why not just marry a beach ball if that's the case? <laughs> yeah, 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 save yourself some money. Get yourself a toaster and a Chia Pet. I mean, I mean, this is unbelievable. That's John Bounds' joke. He just fed that into my ear. We are teleprompter free, but... Uh, Sometimes they do it occasionally, give me little jokes there. Okay, we're about to go to break and uh, discuss the Agenda 21 takeover and how to defend against it. But I wanted to hit a few more reports here with the document cam, because I saw this today and didn't, and, and didn't have time to get to it on the radio. Police take DNA samples from school children and bid to solve murder of girl, 13, found battered. Oh, again, it's for their own good. It might have been the cops probably killed her. But the point is, I mean, seriously, criminology more apt to be them. I'm not saying they're all crooks, but that's the case. I mean, why not take their DNA, my point is, if we're all suspects. And they said, we don't need parental consent. If we get your 11, 12, 13-year-olds to give DNA to see who killed the girl out in the woods by the school, then we'll do it. Well, that's what pedophiles say. They always say, well, the 12-year-old said they'd have sex with me. Or, well, the 12-year-old said they wanted a bottle of Jack Daniels. That's contributing to the delinquency of minors. A child can't give consent. I mean, next it'll be, you know, three-year-olds, CPS, or... Perhaps they'll be there and ask your three-year-old, the TSA will be, I'd like to rape you to the three-year-old, and I'll let you get on the plane. The three-year-old's like, okay. And the parent's like, you can't rape my three-year-old. They're like, they gave consent. I mean, that's what this is all about. They give inoculations in California, ordering the kids to do it. They even signed a law saying they give consent. The parents are like, we don't give consent. They go, this is between your child and the state. Just like the, you know, the state is now literally pulling up going, I got a puppy. Do you consent and get in the car? I got candy. I mean, that's how sick this has gotten. Look at this. Regardless of whether the individual is an adult or juvenile, they're capable of giving consent. We don't require the consent of a parent if we're doing it with someone of a younger age, said so Deputy Jason Ramos of the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. That is the creed of pedophiles. Nambla says, hey, if you're five-year-old, wants to, you know, be picked up in a car and, 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 and have pot-bellied TSA workers rape them, then, you know, well, they were always out on the streets at schoolyards. Now they're at the TSA office, literally. Uh, then, then they give consent. And, and, and Amble's like, you know, we won't have to choke and kill your kid and bury him in a shallow grave, too, if we can get his consent. But you like that part, too. You're not going to stop right there. But it's like, hey, you have consent. 
Well, anybody gets around my children and says, you've got consent, you pedophiles, you know what's going to happen to you. <laughs> I see these cops everywhere saying, the kids give us their consent. Let's give you today's quote, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go to break and come back with an incredible expose with Joel Skousen, premier expert on strategic relocation and preparedness prepping. This is by Richard Henry Lee, founding father. The Constitution shall never be construed to prevent the people of the United States who are peaceable citizens from keeping their own arms. Very well said, sir. Of course, you weren't a pot belly pedophile. You probably believe parents were over their kids and that five-year-olds didn't give consent. But again, you were a human being, not a scumbag piece of filth. We're going to go to break. We'll be right back with Joel Skousen. I'm Alex Jones. The globalists do not like this transmission. Please use it while it's still here. Get it out to everyone. Stay with us. I'm announcing our biggest contest ever. And we're looking for people who love freedom and who want to be all in in the resistance to tyrants. So you say you want to fight the new world order. Why, if you were on the radio, if you were Alex Jones, you'd really kick some globalist ass. Well, here's your chance. We're hiring not one, but two new reporters whose reports are going to be on the radio whose reports are going to be on the nightly news, who will even anchor the show. If you're ready, here's your chance to step into my shoes, and I hope you surpass what I've done. Two winners, $10,000 in prizes, and a shot to be a reporter inside the InfoWars.com command center. We're looking to hire one male reporter and one female reporter. And when you win, you win $5,000. Your video gets seen by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people on YouTube. And you get put into the very front of the running to be hired as a reporter slash anchor right here in our operation. Do you have what it takes to be the next Info Warrior? The rules are posted below me here and at InfoWars.com. This is a big deal. You know, the globalists are expanding their global empire, but at the same time, the people are waking up all over the world. We've expanded our operations in the last year. We've added the nightly news five nights a week. We're making more special reports. We're reaching 15 million people every week. In a year, I want that to be 30 million. This is your chance to join the team. I want to see what you can do. But a big hint is this. Can your news piece make the news? Does it get people's attention? Does it educate people? Does it open minds? That's more important than being beautiful or speaking with perfect eloquence as an orator. All of that is important, but we're looking for people that have that magic spark, that fire of liberty in their heart, because I want you to join our team. I want to give you a launch pad so you can really take off and engage the globalist. And if this works, we'll have contests all the time and we'll continue to build this operation. I'm involved in a talent search looking for people who have the fires of liberty burning in their hearts and their minds. You've got until April 30th to complete your news report and then we'll announce the winners one week later. Are you going to join the info war? Do you have what it takes? It's up to you. All serious entries will be posted on InfoWars.com. So everybody wins. You're getting the message of liberty out, and that's what really matters. But in the final equation, it's not about showing Alex Jones what you got. It's about showing the world and the globalist that no army can stop an idea whose time has come. Join me in the InfoWar. So you say you want to fight the info war. You say you want to go head up against the new world order. You can do a better job than Alex Jones. I know you can. And here's your chance to prove your mettle.
I really enjoy it when the globalists try to poison us and uh, well, we resist them via a free market system. Hello, my fellow Info Warriors. Alex Jones here, introducing you to the Pro Pure family of gravity fed filters. Now, you know that the globalists are filling our water with radioactive isotopes, fluoride, lead, mercury, arsenic. And one of the few systems that can efficiently and economically remove or reduce down to non detectable levels these poisons are gravity fed filters. And Pro Pure is the top of the line. Their filters are impregnated with silver, a natural antibiotic. On top of that, they're bigger, so they filter faster. You don't have to prime these the first time you use them. It's amazing. Go to InfoWars.com and click on the shopping cart link uh, to see the entire family of these babies. Now, the fluoride they add to our water is so tiny that most filters can't cut it out. But ProPure has their system that will, again, reduce it to non-detectable levels, almost get all of it out of there. That's also available. And if you look at the different systems they offer, the ProPure big brush finish is on a stand, so it's easier on a table or at your restaurant or wherever you have it to go up with a glass or a mug and fill it up. Then there's this big baby right here, the ProPure King large version. Got a lot of different options that come with it. Also, they have the ProPure Big, probably one of the best values out there. And of course, it's burnished stainless steel. And then what I use on my RV, something that's great for your hunting cabin or the back porch is the Pro Pure Traveler. Small and portable, but packs a huge punch, cleans out all that garbage. They also have a glass sight spigot, so you don't have to take the top off and look in the bottom area to see how much water. You can see how fast it's filtering with this optional uh, system. The globalists obviously are hitting us through our water. It's time to take control of our lives. It's time to not give our children and families these poisons. And these systems cut it down to non-detectable levels across the board. ProPure is the name. I only promote what I believe in. And I use ProPure in my home and my office. And I recommend that you check out the information on ProPure at InfoWars.com. We already have the lowest price at InfoWars.com on the ProPure gravity filter system. But when you add in the 10% off when InfoWarriors use the product code WATER at InfoWars.com, nobody can top it. So again, it's a win-win-win. Stop drinking the poison water. Uh, checkmate the globalists when it comes to your health and support InfoWars.com and the work we're doing here. You know, many revolutionaries rob banks and things and kidnap people for funds. We promote in the free market the products we use that are about preparedness. That's how we fund this revolution against the New World Order in our move to restore our constitutional republic and a spirit of 1776 worldwide. Check it out at InfoWars.com. Pro Pure, top of the line, number one, most powerful and effective and economical gravity fed water system in the world. Pro Pure, available, discounted at InfoWars.com. Don't forget product code WATER to save 10%. It's the latest generation, years in development. Pro Pure is the name. And welcome back to this special extended edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Now for the next 60 minutes, we're going to talk to an amazing researcher, political scientist, and uh, high security retreat uh, builder, Joel Skousen, fighter pilot during the Vietnam era. His uncle was Cleon Skousen, who first uh, began to expose how the super rich were actually using communism to wage war against the middle class. Uh, just amazing research, and Joel was on with me last year, and in over an hour and a half of radio, we didn't get to one-tenth of what is in this book. And I've had top survivalist experts on, uh, like James Wesley Rawls and others, and they have said strategic relocation uh, is just a one-of-a-kind. I mean, it, it's real analysis, uh, deep research, and it's it, it's done in a textbook form. It's very easy to understand. We've got incredible graphics from the book that Darren McBreen put together uh, throughout this presentation. And this is just a basic. We could spend 10 hours 
and not cover everything, but it's good to just get thinking and moving. And don't ever think it's not too late to be prepared. The government's been preparing for decades, other governments preparing, but saying you're crazy if you get prepared. But now Americans are finally starting to prep. They're understanding how precarious our civilization is and that we have traitors inside via Agenda 21 who have said they want to deindustrialize us and shut down our society as a mode of control. The, 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 the New World Order hates America. And, and wants to destroy it. And so we're going to break that down with Joel Skousen. Um, he's also the editor of World Affairs Brief and a frequent contributor politically uh, to my radio show. But this book, Strategic Relocation, uh, the newest edition, been out for about four or five months, is amazing. And, and last time he was on, the book sold out and they had to reprint. So we do have some of these now. The new edition available at Infowars.com. We can ship these out to you. Ship it out the door in the next 24 hours if you order it at InfoWars.com. And that also supports our information war against the globalist and the work Joel's doing. So thank you for your financial support as well. It takes a lot to run an independent news system. And that's a win-win scenario where we promote things we believe in, and that funds our overall operation. Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places, third edition by Joel M. Skousen and Andrew Skousen. Amazing research. And again, we'll be showing you some of those uh, graphics. Joel, thank you so much for taking time out today to join us via video Skype. Uh, my pleasure, Alex, uh, to be with you. you. You've got the floor. Just a general analysis of where the world is today, because viewers will want to know that. And of course, Joel, when you uh, are done answering that question, why are the elites themselves digging in? Joel Skousen. It's essential to understand, Alex, that the government, and I don't have to tell you this, the government is intending some down to someday to take down dissidents, those that disagree, those that believe in conspiracy. And it's important to understand that they're taking many years to prepare the people to do that. The TSA monitoring of individuals, uh, uh, the screening at the airports, the now screening at bus stations, the uh, um, Viper teams that are on highways checking people out. We're getting close to a show your papers mentality that was uh, prominent during the Hitler regime. They're preparing, of course, to do indefinite detention. That's one of the scariest things when you lose habeas corpus, the right to bring forth the body and, and, uh, and determine through a hearing why they should be, be locked up. And the government clearly is intending to lock people up and throw away the key and not tell you or tell any of your relatives where or what you're doing. It's also very dangerous, as you've documented on Infowars.com, the United States has been preparing, shoveling millions of dollars out the door towards the creation of, of uh, detention camps, concentration camps in the verbiage of World War II. But this is uh, terrifying to American people. And what my message is, is that this is very real, uh, it's going to happen someday. It may be a few years and before they start to implement that. They have to have, obviously, an excuse to be able to uh, create martial law. They cannot do it on a flimsy excuse. They've used terrorism to the hilt for a decade now, and, and that's wearing off people because we really don't have real terrorism. We have the kind of provoked terrorism that allows them to uh, justify these continuing draconian laws. But eventually it will come down upon us, and people have to be prepared beforehand. Once the day of reckoning comes, once people start to disappear like you and I, and people start to wonder where did Alex Jones go, the day of reckoning is here, and people have to be prepared long in advance of that. One of the questions I get often is, uh, you know, who's preparing? What's this prepper movement all about? Well, it is true that well-heeled people are finally joining the movement. The prepper movement, that is, people who are professionals, who are starting to prepare, uh, has just tripled and quadrupled even the past two years. And the reason is, the people with money have heretofore always thought that government will take care of us, government won't fall, government can handle everything. And everything we've learned about the finances of the economics this year has told us that the governments cannot sustain this forever, and they are bending over backwards to bail out the EU, to bail out the United States, and there's no end in sight. And so even well-heeled people are starting to throw dollars at this. We've just completed the largest project we've ever done in the United States, over many, many multi-million dollars, private residence, completely secure, and uh, 
This has never been done before. We've done hundreds of projects. We've done projects in every state of the union, but this is the first time done something where clients can afford everything possible that we have been able to design, including uh, ballistic shutters and automatic mechanisms for tracking uh, intrusion with cameras and other means uh, available. Even the government has been preparing. In fact, they've been preparing decades ago. I used to get information from contractors in Colorado telling me when they'd see one of my designs, oh, we did something similar to this a couple of years ago for an ex-CIA uh, deputy chief who moved here and he put a bunker under his house. And DEA people and uh, ex-military types that were in the know were building bunkers under their cabins in the remote areas of Colorado. And the reason was clear that they knew that someday the government would allow a major attack upon this nation, a major social unrest and destruction and that they were prepared for. They don't tell us to prepare. Joel, yeah. I want to interrupt you just because I want to get into the book itself, Strategic Relocation, and, and to tell that but people should just get the book and really study it because it's, it's almost impossible, you know, in spoken word to break down the deep research that you've put into this. And as I said, the top experts we've interviewed continue to reference Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places, third edition that's available at Infowars.com. And I want to thank you for making it. But... I will get this question after you're on. So let's just answer it now and then let you continue and get in. I'm sorry to interrupt. Why do the elite want this? People keep thinking, hey, America's run by Americans. You know, it's, it's, it's like the country we had 70 years ago. Why, A, who's running the country and what's their larger stratagem? Uh, wh why do they want to destroy the golden goose? Well, it isn't really that they want to destroy the golden. It's a complex answer to that question. I'll try to give a synopsis as quickly as I can. These people are what I call globalists. They believe in a global agenda, a global world government, and global control of all economic resources, but not in the sense of communism, not in the sense they want to destroy it. They want to harness it. They want to put it to use. They want to control it. They want to milk it. For everything it's worth without destroying it. And in that, they're more like Fabian socialists than they are communists. But they still do want absolute control over dissidents. And the way they're going to get this control is by bringing what I believe is a third world war, a nuclear war upon this nation. Now, I realize that we're all concerned about economic collapse. I have long said in my world affairs brief, I don't believe they're going to collapse the dollar. I think they're going to milk it in a downward slide until war comes, and then war will give them an excuse to do two things. One, walk away from the debt, which is unpayable. There's no way we can undo the deep debt structure that we've got. But they can walk away without blame because they can blame it on war, having destroyed the computers, having destroyed the financial centers. And then the number two thing they say after they come out of their bunkers is say, now, the Russians deceived us, the Chinese deceived us, we didn't know that they were going to attack. But our military is destroyed, and our only salvation now is to join forces with the remnants of the rest of the world, and we'll put together a militarized world government to beat Russia and China. And they'll rebuild the new world order without national sovereignty under a militarized, militarized world government, and they'll never give us our sovereignty back like they did after World War II. Now, that's why I think they're preparing. These people know that the war is coming. That's why they're building bunkers, not just nice cabins out in rural country. If they're only preparing for economic collapse, they might be just doing rural, but they're doing bunkers. And that means they know that it's nuclear. That means they know that it's severe and that they have to survive that. And Americans need to survive that too. And Joel, you, you've studied history and written a lot about it. I've studied it. When you look at a Hitler or a Stalin or a Mao or a Pol Pot or a Julius Caesar to a lesser degree, they want total power and domination. That's the goal. They'll do anything to get there. And this is not just your opinion. The elites are saying that they will engage in any amount of mass murder to bring in their global government. And it's all about control. It's about that goal. And if you analyze the mindset, it, it is madness, but there is, a, there is a method to the madness. And they are accelerating their program right now uh, wh why are they so uh, threatened by American patriots and dissidents? Well, I have my answer. We have a chance to beat them. 
I think because of your uncle and yourself and myself and Ron Paul and countless others, G. Edward Griffin, that for decades have been exposing the criminal conspiracy of the globalist, that that's our ace in the hole. And because of the fact that people were ready to be arrested, ridiculed, attacked, all of that, now you see millions of guns being sold a month. They say, we don't trust the government, that's why. We, we see people becoming aware of this at such a level that I think there's chances that we could take this country back. So let's talk about your your views on that versus uh, you know uh, where this is going if they go ahead with their uh, their provocation to allow this country to be attacked. Well, I do believe, Alex, that the only thing that threatens their existence is a broad-based knowledge of conspiracy about this globalist agenda. And it has to do with Agenda 21. It has to do with the Law of the Sea Treaty. All of that control agenda comes into the basis of world government and government control. And that's why the media, even the faux media, Fox News, et cetera, is so virulent against anyone like you and I who believes in conspiracy. They will not have us on national television, even to discuss it, because they don't want the genie out of the bottle. That's our only salvation, is to make sure that a broader sector of America knows that there is a real live conspiracy to control government, to control both political parties. Anyone who thinks that we're going to gain salvation by electing another Republican is kidding themselves. It's never going to happen. That's, it's not that it's unhelpful in the sense that if you campaign for someone like Ron Paul, who really will make a difference, but if you go after an establishment, representative of the Republican Party. They will only do what George Bush did to us. And conservatives have to wake up to this. I think a lot of them did wake up, up after George Bush. I think if Romney gets elected, they're going to wake up when he betrays us as well. It's going to be very sad, but unfortunately, that's the reality. We have got to realize that it's only by using credible information to, dis to convince people that there is conspiracy in this world legitimate conspiracy that we're going to be able to win this battle. And that's what they're afraid of. That's why they have to shut down dissidents. Ex exactly. I mean, everything they do is obsessed with those of us that know, but now it's not your uncle 60 years ago exposing this. They're announcing world government. They're announcing global carbon taxes. California is forcibly inoculating kids without parental consent. Uh, they're openly announcing they're going to outlaw single-parent homes. I mean, it's, it's it now... It's, it's, all, it's more and more in the open. Why do you think they've shifted to it being out in the open now? So much more. It's to accustom people to it. Uh, they used to have a rule. You don't ever inconvenience the majority enough to make them rebel against your agenda. But they started doing it with the TSA. It's in your face. It's, uh, and they won't let up, no matter how much people complain, no matter how, how, how ruthless they become with the TSA. Uh, they won't let up, and that's because they want to get us used to it, and they're driving it through, and that's what I think they're doing. They're, they're more and more confident now that we don't have the power to cut them off, and right now we don't until we get the word out more and more. I took a lot of flack in my book, Strategic Relocation, because I do discuss and give evidence of conspiracy. I don't make it the major portion of it, but uh, I do take some flack to have people who have dismissed my book because I believe in it. But uh, as one person said on the Jim Rawls survival blog website, that's a reason to believe in it because he, he sees what's going on. He's well, Joel, let me stop you right there. I have to be careful here because I, I'm told things in confidence and if I give up confidences, then I don't get the information. But I, three separate times, have had offers from national media in the last 12 years and they, they admit global government's real. They say, it's best for all humanity. Stop talking about it, and we'll make you this big star. I was offered Glenn Beck's job before it existed. Once I saw him, I knew that that was what was happening. And now I know from inside sources, he refused to fully sell out, kind of woke up, so they kicked him out. I talked to another national media figure yesterday, and he said, oh my, well, he said more than oh my gosh. He said, it's all true. I can't say it over a phone. But I was taken in, like I'd heard you years ago say this, Alex, I didn't fully believe it. I was told the same stuff you were told. And this person is a contemporary, probably even bigger than I am in some ways. If I said the name, everybody would know it. But 
it's like you don't know it's real until they call up and threaten to cut your wife's head off to her and say, by the way, I'm watching you, your dog's on the back porch right now wanting in. You, you know, you don't know how, and, and in a way it's a blessing that I have so early on had it hit me full on. Because let me just tell viewers out there, this is real. <laughs> I mean, the conspiracy is real. And my point was, you've got to feel good in a way, Joel, that you, know, you get criticized for talking about globalist conspiracy. Well, now it's out in the open, but still some people laugh at us. And I'm just telling them, look, this is real. This is like denying the Atlantic Ocean exists. Do you see my point? Yeah, absolutely. But it's pretty difficult, uh, you know, and we're dealing with even false conspiracies that throughout there. There's this is guy Drake now uh, explaining or trying to make the case that the military is about ready to arrest all of the globalists, the whole cabal. And it's absolutely bogus. We always hear this every year, decade yeah. after decade, the white knights are coming. Everything's OK. Yeah, it's not going to happen. We're going to have to face this head on with good hard work, with uh, helping people understand what's real and uh, and getting people person by person to change their opinions and get get ready to accept nothing but people and elect people who will not compromise with this establishment. And that's why with all of the faults that people may criticize Ron Paul with, one thing I assure them, I said he's the only one who we can trust to buck the establishment and stop their agenda. Well, I know I know Senator Rand Paul, you know, personally and privately over the years a little bit. And, and, and he's done a good job up there, but in a way, he's not as pig-headed as his dad, because I had him on yesterday, and he said, well, if Mitt Romney did ask me, I have to say it is an honor. And, and I'm not even saying he's bad leaving the door open, but in a way, it, I just think the pig-headedness for basic issues is the only thing, because, because you can't make deals with the system. And I'm not saying Rand was even saying that, but because he's a nice guy, it's almost like being too nice. I, I'm not even sure what I'm saying. My point is this open world government conspiracy is now open. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? Well, it isn't openly admitted as a conspiracy. It's openly talked about. They're trying to convince people. No one's admitting openly that they have a deep, dark agenda. And that's our point. This is an evil agenda. They may try to sell it for its benefits. They may sell it in the name of free trade, but this is an evil agenda that it's aimed at our freedoms and our liberty and our persons if we dissent against it. I think you just really crystallized things for me. That's it. Before they wouldn't even admit that there was a move to global government yes. and a global tax and all this. And so now they admit that, but say, oh, but it's good. Right. Okay, Joel, we've talked about the lay of the land right now geopolitically. The world government's real. The elites are preparing. We've put together some graphics from your amazing book that we're going to be showing here chapter by chapter. Uh, so basically, it's a high-tech slideshow. You've got the floor in the next 40 minutes or so. Give us a brief synopsis of the book uh, that really is the Bible for finding safe regions, safe areas, uh, You know, not just the prepping supplies themselves, uh, but the general lay of the land. Uh, Joel, lead us through the book. Well, the first thing I do is start out and talk about, uh, this is a new section added in the third edition about international retreaty. There's a lot of the powers that be are moving overseas. Um, I don't think they're actually leaving all of their assets behind in the United States, but there's a lot of people in our uh, liberty movement that are thinking about moving overseas who have done so. And I talk about that extensively uh, as a new section in the book. Uh, but I might just give a few caveats here that are important to keep in mind. First of all, you cannot judge international retreats. And I have lived overseas in many of these nations, so I speak from firsthand experience, by the expat community. These are the expatriates who are reveling in being able to live cheaply and uh, without even bothering them in other countries. There are no guarantees in a lot of these other countries. and Things will be totally different vis-a-vis -vis Americans, foreigners living in other countries than they are right now when people, when those countries want American dollars and are welcoming you there. I can tell you that these other countries, even though our country has the leadership of the globalists, these other countries are lapdogs to those globalists. And they tell them to round up Americans and they'll round them up. That's what you don't realize about other countries. And it's very difficult to hide and blend in, which is your only defense sometimes when you're trying to hide in foreign countries, but you don't match the culture, 
or the language or the race. And so my advice to people who are thinking about uh, moving overseas is to read that section carefully, consider the pros and cons, and last of all, don't burn all your bridges coming back to the United States. And it may well be very, very difficult. One of the reasons I, I also talk about my world affairs briefing is since I track this, and I'm tracking constantly what the powers that we are doing vis-a-vis -vis this future war that's coming, I intend my world affairs brief to also act as a early warning mechanism to people so that they won't be stuck in one place or another uh, where they don't want to be. Going back to the book, Strategic Relocation, I take the point early on in the book after I cover the various threats, and I do cover the full range of threats uh, in general, whether it's population density, cost of living, taxation, government regulation, alternate medicine, freedom to, to practice in various states, gun liberty, uh, homeschooling laws, I cover the military threats, the military targets, the nuclear power plants in their locations, environmental threats, health ratings, water, uh, traffic problems. Uh, in fact, when you go to the individual states in the book, I give a rating to the states of uh, one to five stars, and uh, I give a breakdown, a synopsis of these first sections on the threats. I give a synopsis just in one tiny paragraph for each one of these climate, population density, private land availability, so that you've got at your fingertips uh, a way to compare, to put your finger on one page, uh, one uh, state page versus another. You can flip back and forth. You can look at the maps, which are now in color, showing all of the um, uh, land use within a state, showing all the nuclear targets. It also shows the nuclear targets in adjacent states, which helps you make decisions if you're going to move to a place near the border of one state to another. There's a wealth of information about threats in this book, but it's not so easy to analyze the relative worth of one threat versus another. In other words, all these threats are not equal. Some threats are deadly. Some threats are inconvenient. Some threats are uh, uh, just how you prefer to live. So I try to cover those extensively uh, in the book. Joel, let me interject before you continue because you brought up, you know, which countries are safer than others uh, to move to if you do choose to exit the U.S. Capital controls. Uh, now if you have a few silver coins, they're trying to take them, the TSA is. Now they're at highway checkpoints, uh, spy groups. All of this is happening uh, and Joel, now I'm sure you've seen the legislation that's passed the Senate, it's in the House, to where if you, quote, haven't paid your taxes, no judge, no jury, the IRS just puts you on a list, and then suddenly you can't leave the country and have your passport taken. I mean, that's right out of Stalinist Russia. Indeed it is. Can you comment on that? Sure. The issue of travel controls is going to get ever more important. And remember that every case of a country having travel controls, like South Africa, eventually relents and lets people leave, but they can't take their money with them. So capital controls are essential towards keeping people in the country, because you're not much good if you have to leave the company without a country without your capital. But I think they're going to a total travel control system. I think that's what TSA is all about. And, uh, and that's why I concentrate on strategic relocation relative to North America, because once you do get out of the country, you may not be able to get back in as well. And I happen to believe that most people are going to be able to survive in this country through strategic relocation rather than foreign. And one of my main reasons is this, having lived overseas in Uruguay, Argentina, Chile, uh, Panama, Guatemala, El Salvador, and, and in Europe, I can tell you that the number of people who believe like we do is just a handful in other countries. They're out there, but there are millions, thanks to your efforts, Alex, and, uh, and others, there are millions in this country who believe like we do. And the ability to band together and find protection and find safe places with uh, like-minded people is much greater, perhaps a hundred times greater here than in other countries. And ultimately, it's going to be that combination of being able to blend in because you speak the language, you're native, to be able to hide by blending in and having like-minded people who confront for you if you have such a total control system that you have to be underground and have other people front above ground for you. Chances of doing that here 
much, much better than elsewhere. Joel, I agree. My instinct, my, my gut, my spirit, whatever you want to call it, is educate everybody, expose the globalist, dig in simultaneously, and stand my ground. Instead of, instead of running, just while we still have the internet, while we still have the freedoms that our forebears fought so hard for, hit the globalist as hard as we can and just fight on all fronts. There's a full spectrum resistance to their full spectrum takeover. And the fact is, as things get worse, exponentially more people are now waking up. Uh, again, I think the globalists have miscalculated, but it's going to be one, one hell of a fight. It is. And for those of us who are high profile people and who are fighting, we have to look at the strategy of having our eggs in more than one basket. And I talk about that in my book, The, the Secure Home and Elsewise, that, you know, you have to be wise. You have to, it's better to have multiple baskets to maneuver in than it is to have one big fortress that you think that you're going to maintain. I agree. It's better to have a couple of shacks nobody knows about. That's right. So let me return to the topic of safe places, Alex. Um, there is a major controversy in the movement, and it happens to generally between Jim Wesley Rawls and myself. He has the readout concept, and this is basically five states that meet all the criteria for having a military resistance to the New World Order. This is a military-style strategy combined with uh, the ability to grow and do all things and be, you know, and I pick in my highest rated safe places, the same Intermountain West, but I'm not restricted to this military viewpoint. I'm very skeptical of confronting the kinds of powers that de we're dealing with. I think that we have to have a bigger base of strategy. And one of those strategies that I talk about in my books is concealment and hiding rather than confrontation. I think it's extremely important that people be willing to say, this is too big for me to confront. I'm going underground. I'm, I'm, I'm hiding. I'm going to conceal, and I'll wait till it passes over rather than confront. And part of that strategy is having multiple places to go to. If you can't afford that, at least you do low-profile housing. You don't make a high-profile uh, home that's obviously a fortress that invites the kind of attack that some people uh, would love to have with the government. Uh, but in terms of safe places, I often, most often get the, the question, just tell me where the safe places are, Joel, and I'll move there. And it just isn't that simple because people have to make a living. And while I don't believe that you're, you have to stay wedded to the major metropolitan areas to make a living, you can do some maneuvering, very few people are going to be able to live in rural America without being attached to a job. Most people have to have a financial lifeline. I consulted a lot during uh, prior to Y2K. My first edition of the strategic relocation came out in 1998. A lot of people did not take my advice to stay, to maintain your financial lifetime. They bailed out, they went rural, they had some savings, and they came back a couple of years later and they were calling me and saying, what do I do now? I'm out of money. Self-sufficiency turned out to be a lot more expensive than I thought it was going to be. And I've got no money. And I said, you're going to have to move back into society, reestablish a financial lifeline, and then do this again the right way. And the right way, and I talk about this because most of my clientele who read strategic relocation can't move lock, stock, and barrel. And so I talk a lot about how to do contingency planning, how to move to the periphery, for example, of a major metropolitan area, how to get out of the ways of the major exit routes uh, for refugees that are going to happen. But I want to talk about uh, that as an example that shows the state that you're in, Alex, uh, in Texas. And uh, in this map are several interesting points. There are yellow areas, which I consider the safe areas in this area. And there is also a lot of red areas that are black and or completely red around Dallas, the major population areas of Austin and San Antonio, and large red lines connecting them. These are what I call refugee in and or outflow routes. And it's important to realize that not only to avoid high population density centers, but to watch where those refugees, when food and water is cut off, are going to flow outward into the rural areas. And naturally, most people will flow outward up to 50 miles directly out into the land, but a lot of people will be taking to the roads 
the freeway will be clogged, they'll be unusable. And it's very important for people to plan ahead if you're going to stay within a major metropolitan area of how to get out of those areas. And here's the strategies. The first of all is to get advance warnings so that you're not on the last train out or you're not in the middle of the pack when you're trying to leave. The second strategy is to be at the periphery of those metropolitan areas so that you're not having to transit an hour's worth of driving to get out of a major metropolitan area uh, through the suburbs as they in, empty out into the various feeder roads. And the other strategy has to do with the graphic that I put up um, about um, retreating exit routes on page uh, 290. This is a very interesting graphic that takes the situation, takes us through New Jersey. New Jersey is the highest density population area because behind it is Staten Island, Manhattan, New York, and all of those people are funneling and going west. They can't go east because there's the ocean. They can either go north, south, or west, and west of that is Philadelphia. All of that has to transit through New Jersey in any direction that they go. And so I try to point out some very interesting thing in the book of how you plan an escape route. Because a lot of people don't realize that, um, uh, that the freeways are like islands. They're like moats around you, and they stop you from crossing them. In other words, you have to find roads that go under the freeways where there isn't an on-ramp or an exit. And the reason you don't want to cross a freeway where there's an on-ramp is because those exits or uh, on-ramps will be clogged with people trying to get on or off the freeway. And if you look at Google Maps, you can actually zero down in close enough that you can follow a freeway around the area that you're trying to get out of. And you can pick places that, uh, that don't have uh, an on-ramp or an exit. There are very few, but if you pick those and isolate those and plan routes to get through there, you can do it. And that's the kind of stuff that really makes strategic relocation very valuable for people. I want to briefly interrupt you to talk about uh, that general map you have of just the basic ratings of states. I notice places like New York, California, they only have one star out of a possible, what, five stars? That's right. And there are some states that have zero stars, like Hawaii and Florida. Now, these are places that you simply don't want to be. The entire state of Hawaii is going to be a death trap because it's an island. And that island can't grow very much food. The big island has some possibilities, but none of the other islands can grow very much. Okay, break that down. What would it be like during a real collapse or a nuclear war or total depression uh, if you were in Florida or Hawaii, zero star, versus things like California, one star? Well, for example, an island is the worst place that you can be, especially one like Hawaii, which is a tempting target for occupation. Uh, I don't think in this nuclear war that China and Russia, for example, are going to occupy the United States uh, because of too many weapons here. They just want to get it out of the way militarily so they can blackmail the rest of the world into submission. But Hawaii is a very tempting target to be occupied. I think China will, in fact, uh, play the role that Japan did uh, with uh, Hitler during World War II. They'll take the entire Far East including Hawaii, all of the islands, the Philippines, Japan. There's a grudge match between China and Japan. And I'm predicting that they'll also take Australia and New Zealand, which does not make them good retreat sites. Uh, there are other negatives about Australia and New Zealand, but that's the worst, is that Australia is selling its soul to China, letting China buy up all of its natural resources. China wants Australia, especially during a war. You'll see that occupied. Yeah, I saw reports in the Wall Street Journal that over 90% of Australian mines are now Chinese-owned and run, and 98% of rare earth minerals worldwide are being mined by the Chinese. Why did the New World Order uh, Anglo-American globalist allow that to happen? Is that to lure China in? Yeah, I think we have seen this ever since allowing Mao to take over and undercutting Chiang Kai-shek militarily. The New World Order has always wanted to build these enemies in order to create the kind of war that would force the world into a New World Order, force the world into a global government, and having a powerful China uh, rattling the cages of the world is just what that does. And, uh, unfortunately, uh, I think uh, it's going to happen someday. I think Australia is going to lose its freedom. Now, I do think 
for example, that my theory indicates that China will make a deal with the West and attack Russia's rear in order to defeat Russia. China and, and Russia are only temporary allies. They're co-predators, along with uh, the Anglo-American establishment to try to, each of these three predator centers wants to win over the world. And I think China will help the West take Russia down after they start this war. And in doing so, they'll give back eventually Japan, uh, Australia, and New Zealand, but it won't be until after a lot of damage is done during an occupation. All right, I want to continue going through this, but uh, the book that's available again at Infowars.com, it's essential reading for everybody out there, Strategic Relocation, North America, third edition. But just a brief synopsis, and I know I'm springing this on you, Joel, but I know you can answer it from your perspective. The Anglo-American, global, you know, U.S., England, European elite, their endgame goal, if they had total control, what would they do versus the Russians and the Chinese? Because I know the Russians are incredibly corrupt, have their own problems. The, the, the communist Chinese, very corrupt. But I see the communist Chinese have made deals with the West on eugenics, population. I see the West building them up. So I do see that backdoor deal between the chi -coms and the Anglo-Americans. But when I see the Anglo-American group, they want the eugenics. They want the world government. They've got the big plans. And of the three groups, I see them in the final equation as the most wicked. But I see the Russians also kind of following originally the eugenics model. So from my research, people have to understand, why not just surrender to the new world order, let them have world government so this won't happen? They want the world government to reduce population. They want it to carry out the next phase. So if they ever got it, then we're even in more trouble. I mean, these are just control freaks to the power of infinity. I know that's a long rambling analysis, but your take on the mindset of these three elites, how they interchange. Well, ultimately, uh, and I don't talk about this much in my books, but there's only th one thing to explain what I call the generational effect in the Anglo-American establishment. If it were like Stalin, if it were like Hitler, who were individual power men, power hungry, it would die out after they die out. But it doesn't in the Anglo-American establishment. It goes from one leader after another, and, and actually it's an oligarchy of several leaders who keep themselves hidden behind the scenes. But this has a generational effect that has been going on for centuries, and that's not typical of a single leader that keeps moving on. And I have to owe that to what I think is a satanic dark side connection, ultimately that gives guidance uh, to these conspiracies. But I do think that in order to- Hold on, let me stop you. That's very powerful. Look at Bohemian Grove, look at Skull and Bones. All my research, they, th whether it's real or not, whether you're a Christian or not, the elite do believe they're getting that dark guidance. Please continue. That's right. And I think that China and Russia are um, tend to have a, a generational transitional effect as well. It keeps going on beyond one powerful leader after another. Um, I think, frankly, that um, uh, they all intend to win. They don't ever intend to share power with anyone. If you look at the Chinese mentality, the Chinese mentality is one of disgust for the West. They do not respect the West, except for its temporary power. They've always viewed the West as, a non, as an inferior society. There is a disregard for humanity that's endemic within Chinese culture. They don't mind killing millions. The, the Slavs don't mind it either. That's why there's been such a disregard for humanity among Stalin and others. And there is among the elite, the globalist elite, this same almost satanic-based corruption uh, that has a disregard for humanity, even though Western culture does not have it. It respects humanity because of its Anglo uh, and Christian roots. But um, I think that we're dealing with three predator powers that uh, will never work together except in temporary alliances. I do believe that China will begin this war with Russia. They, in fact, um, and Russia is only learning about the Anglo-American conspiracy. One of the signs of that is RT, Russia Today, which is a KGB television outfit, is focusing most of its broadcast to American conservatives trying to help and foment conspiracy, not because you know uh, 
They see it as a way to help take down America. They're not our friend even though they put out a lot of truth sometimes because they're trying to play our... Exactly. Brand. They see the globalist trying to weaken America and Europe so they can take it over so the globalist can manage us better, and they'll aid that because they understand it weakens the people generally. That's right. That's right. And boy, that's why the elite are so arrogant coming out in the open, as you said earlier. Not that I'm some on some high horse, but I look at the slovenliness, the slob behavior. I know executives wealthy people who hold high position and they could care less about reality. They're decadent slobs. They're not dedicated to anything but hedonism. They're ignorant. And then you look at the general public, they're like that. I mean, there's a large portion that's awake, but it's still a minority. And so you've got either people that are waking up and becoming more uh, you know, decent and hardworking, or you've got an acceleration, a wheat from the chaff. And I think about what will happen with these decadent populations during real crises when our forebears were a lot more moral uh, during the Great Depression? University estimates are 7 million during the 10-year Great Depression died of starvation or complications from malnutrition or, or, or uh, other connections to the Depression. 90% rural, most of them self-sufficient versus 89% urban, half of the 11% uh, being self-sufficient that are rural. I mean, that people bomb of just bedlam, it'll make New Orleans look like a cakewalk. Uh, it, it, it just, it, it boggles my mind the type of powder keg we're sitting on. Indeed, I'm really worried about the population demographics as well. For example, uh, you know, we have a problem with our the black communities with such a high percentage uh, without a father in the home, with a high percentage on welfare. We have a, a, a fairly large percentage of the Latino community, which is angry with American society and trying to take it back. Uh, we have a large corrupt sector. We have, what, 40 million people plus on food stamps in America. This is a tremendous benefit corrupt, huge minority that threatens our very well-being someday. And that's why I really concentrate on these population density maps, which I put in strategic relocation. You've got to be very, very careful of where those population densities are going to empty out someday when food supplies get cut off or when there's a major war or even the threat. The biggest thing I worry about terrorism is not real terrorism because I think most of what we face is provoked terrorism or manufactured terrorism by a government. But it's the government reaction to the very terrorist threats that they create that creates, creates a great deal of consternation, whether it's closing down freeways, shutting down the airlines, it could shut down transportation at will, all in the name of terrorism, and it causes instant panic among people. And that's one of the things that I talk about in strategic relocation about how to find safe places is to be very, very careful of analyzing where those exit routes are going to be. A lot of people, when I'm designing homes, people they ask, well, how many miles should I be away from a road or a freeway? And while I generally give five miles and a mile against any uh, major local road, it's much more important to understand how to be out of the way, not to build on a hill, not to be visible from a long distance away, how to be away on turning roads rather than long straight roads where you can see 100 miles. Uh, it's important to pick the strategic terrain that people will not be tempted to go to as they're being refugees going down a uh, going down a road. Let me go back to that for a moment. I mean, you talk about Hawaii, Florida being the worst area because one's a peninsula, huge population, the other is an isolated island that's not self-sufficient. But just looking at Los Angeles, I mean, you're talking about, in California, 30-something million people. You're talking about 6, 7, 10 million, that whole metro area. I mean, you talk about bedlam. If there's an earthquake, which they predict is going to hit, that'll make uh, what happened last year in Japan look tame. That is going to be a Mad Max scenario. And of the feds, who are so corrupt now in the states, couldn't deal with Katrina. I mean, for me, anyone living in Southern California is off their rocker nuts. Well, the problem is that, you know, you have that big basin and you've driven it, I've driven it. It takes you, what, to almost two hours at freeway speeds to cross that basin. And there are seven exits out of that basement. Seven exits for over 30 million people. 
that's just insane, you know, to to be there. And I'm very clear about uh, in my book that people should not be in those, or if they have to be, and, and I'm realistic, some people, good Christian conservatives have to be there. They've got to be uh, close to some of the minor exits so they can be the first ones out of that basement of the, a basin if they have any possibility of retreating. Exactly. Gonna... That's the good news, because most people being zombies, it's sad they're zombies, they're just, they're going to wait until the system tells them what to do. They're going to sit there for two or three, four days looking for magic help that's going to come from big daddy government, and when they figure out the help isn't coming, that's when the panic begins. And I've made this point, as the depression gets worse and people finally start to prep, that's going to drive up prices in all of this. It is. You look at San Diego, for example, there's even a worse situation. Not only is it a major nuclear target, but you can't go north without running into the L.A. basin. There's just no way to get around it. You have to go east to El Centro and start north, and then you've got the Grand Canyon blocking your way. I mean, it's an incredible design feature to try to get a safe route of people out of the San Diego area because of the fact that they're blocked. And once you get off around the Grand Canyon, you've got two choices. You go left. And you go up towards Las Vegas, and that's a, a terrible place to try to get through because it's only a freeway. That's the only road going through there, or Highway 95. And then if you go the other way, there's a little narrow two-lane road, Highway 89, going up the east side of the Grand Canyon. I mean, people trying to get out of Southern California have a real problem. So in my mind, am, am I correct saying that's probably one of the worst places in North America itself in the contiguous area? Or is it D.C.? Is it New York? I mean, New York, we're talking about L.A. being bad. Wow. What's New York being a peninsula? Yeah, New York is number one. That's the worst area, New York, New Jersey area. And just because, you know, at least in the L.A. basin, once you get over the mountains, you've got some clear shots. You've got some desert. You don't have that in the New York, New Jersey. Or you've just got subdivisions which get a little bit less dense as you go 50, as you go 100 miles, you've still got millions of people. So it's just going to be one clogged mass of humanity in the New York area. And by the way, you're cut off on the East Coast by the water. So you've only got half of an exit, and it's all the more blocked. Number two, of course, is the L.A., San Diego, uh, Southern California. Number three is probably the Seattle area, a tremendous confluence of packed people into a bowl created and surrounded by mountains with, once again, probably three or four exits out of that Seattle area. And it's a major nuclear target to boot, which makes it even more panic stricken when war comes. Yeah, you know, the problem is, it's not just Joel Skousen saying this, it's not just Alex Jones saying this, when you study what governments are saying, and I've seen all these Pentagon reports, British Ministry of Defense reports, they say it is a probability. I just saw a new MIT report out saying within 20 years they see total civilization collapse, and there's all these real factors that could cause and trigger partial or full collapse, but then you've got the Agenda 21 crowd doing everything they can to sabotage stuff so they can consolidate power. It, it, it is pure deviltry. I mean, this is, this is the, they think there's a method to their madness, Joel, but there really isn't. It, it, it's just, it's pure craziness. Yeah, you know, a lot of people say it won't happen because human beings just won't destroy the infrastructure that they've built up. And I said, well, if these were people just doing it for their own self-interest, you'd be right. They wouldn't do it. But remember, these people already have as much power, as much wine, women's song, yachts, uh, cabins in the mountains, anything a human being wants, and they still want more power. What, is, what explains that? It can only be satanic inspiration because they've got already as much. Why would you want any more power? What more power can a human being manipulate or work with unless they're working for a higher power which wants to destroy God, which wants to destroy what is good in this world? And I think that's the kind of battle. And unfortunately, the more soft this world gets, the less the world believes in systematic evil. They only believe in a few random individuals. They trust Americans. They trust and they believe in positive thinking. That's deadly in today's world. They're yeah, right. Uh, oh, yeah. People say, be positive. See the bright side. The only positive side is being honest about what we face, as Patrick Henry said, and making preparation for it. I mean, there are so many examples 
of people thinking you can just be delusional and make it all okay? Well, returning to the basic concept of safe places, let me just give a general overview of play of the United States in general and why I rate some areas higher than another. Let's do that. Let me remind them the book is available at Infowars.com right now, Strategic Relocation, North American Guide to Safe Places, third edition, and also gets a free citizen rule book when they order it. Again, folks, I have made preparations myself. This is real. The threats run from bad to worse. You need to get prepared. Ants get prepared for the winter. We've been taught that we shouldn't get prepared. That is anti-common sense, anti our heritage. We all need to get prepared and hope that this isn't coming. But unfortunately, we know it is. Joel, go ahead. As I said, unlike Jim Rawls, who I really respect, uh, he's got a great blog on Survival Blog. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, I just don't believe it's realistic to have five, uh, all the people try to retreat to five states in the United States. Uh, I think realistically we have to provide information for people on how to retreat in the best situations that they can do. So I provide, even in, in Hawaii, which I give a zero, I provide potential retreat uh, advice. I divide the country into regions according to retreating ability and to try to explain the problems that are endemic to the region. There's the Northeast and there's the Southeast, there's South Central, there's North Central, there's Southwest and Northwest. And there's the Inner Mountain West. The Inner Mountain West has my highest rating overall. That doesn't mean that everybody has to move or has uh, into the Inner Mountain West. But if you look at being centered around Salt Lake City, now that's not a safe city in and of itself. But it's 1,100 miles to San Francisco. It's 750 miles to, San, uh, to Los Angeles. It's uh, uh, 850 miles to Portland and 1,000 miles to Seattle. And it's five or 600 miles to Denver. And in between this trackless distance is six or 700 miles of wasteland, of desert that simply cannot be crossed by refugees who are fleeing out of the major cities when they fall apart. That's why that area gets the highest rating, just because it has this buffer zone of natural terrain, making it very difficult for people to get there. Now, there are other places that have some of those same similar, though not as good, terrain capabilities. In the Texas region, for example, you've got West Texas out there that has huge trackless areas that cannot be get to, cannot be crossed by foot. Uh, and you can run out of fuel easily trying to drive across Texas. And so I isolate areas in there that are far enough away from the cities that they won't be able to walk to those or get to in a tank of gas. East Texas, for example, has some nice retreat areas, but if you look, there's dozens and dozens of small towns, and it isn't as strategically resistant to refugees flowing from one of those small towns to another. It's very instructive to understand that in World War II, if you look at what happened to the farms after Russia started to invade Germany and everyone in the city started to take to the streets, they fanned, uh, take to the roads, they fanned out on either side and probably got as much as 10 to 15 miles either side of the roads and stripped all those farms clean. So you've got to be careful in rural areas if you're close to any of those major refugee retreat routes that eventually those farms will get taken down. And the ones that will be safe are the ones that are far enough away that you can't walk to from the normal refugee pass. In general, I give the Northeast a fairly poor rating just because, in fact, everything on the East Coast has this high density area east of the Appalachians is approximately you know, three to 400 people per square mile averaging in the major metropolitan areas have 1,000 to 2,000 people per square mile. You empty those people out into the countryside and you're gonna have a tremendous difficulty, even growing cops in rural areas, trying to wake them, awake them getting ripe for fear of people standing around your fence just waiting to take them. Uh, and it's almost an impossible situation to kind of guard fruit when there's a mass starvation scenario. So well, I understand rivers. that your, Joel, your general map is a generality when it just gives basic ratings for a state. But as you said, I mean, West Texas is so giant and there's nothing out there. But then there's the issue of the fact that it's arid. You know, I mean, a lot of it is semi, semi desert. I mean, I live outside town in central Texas. I live, you know, three, four miles off a major road. But, you know, still, it's not perfect. I can't imagine living in the, you know, the center of town itself 
I want to keep moving around the country, but why is New Mexico such a low rating? Uh, because there's not a lot of people there, but I'm sure you have reasons for that. Why is Louisiana one star? Why is Mississippi one star? Alabama two, Tennessee three and a half, uh, you know, Kentucky three stars. Give us your, uh, break it down. Yeah. One of the reasons uh, New Mexico is so lowly rated is there's a lot of military activity there. Uh, there's very few places where you can live in the deserts because of low water supplies. Uh, uh, Arizona has a lot of those areas too, but there are aquifers in Arizona that uh, you can find water, not much in New Mexico, and those places have fairly high population centers. The southeast, Mississippi, Alabama, have low ratings because, first of all, they're in the path of Floridians, which will empty out. Florida is simply not capable of self-sustaining itself without air conditioning and without uh, government services and supplies. There are just too many people for land that is not suitable for uh, much agriculture. And you've got the hurricane issue. And you've got the hurricanes, but a lot of people are going to empty out, and that's what they're going to do is head for all of those states. You have a lot of population in the southern states. A lot of people have moved down there. And when they start to empty out into the countryside, added to that, all the Floridians, you're going to have a real problem with people, uh, with refugees. I want to show this on the map. Where are the elites moving? I know a lot of them to Idaho, a lot of them to Utah, but they're also at Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Montana. Uh, what's the greatest uh, concentration of elites and their bunkers that you've seen? by far in Colorado. And there's a reason for that is that Denver is the Western center of the dark side of government. They have all of the secret facilities in Denver, underneath the Denver airport are major underground uh, bunker systems for the elite. And the elite know that, and that's why they're moving in their own personal bunkers to the ski resorts, mostly of Colorado. They have lots of money. They wanna live the high life while they're in bunkers while they have their bunkers, and that's why they're in Colorado. So I would say almost 60% of the elite have reserved places in Colorado, and that's one of the reasons I downgrade Colorado is because Denver is the hotbed of government control. Well, they admit that it is the shadow government headquarters uh, with, with Cheyenne Mountain and all the rest of it. They admit that's the second designated alternate government shadow government headquarters. That's on record. That's right, but a lot of people don't understand that they control a lot of the Colorado government, especially the city government in Denver and the surrounding communities uh, have a lot of, uh, they, they control insurance companies, they control uh, real estate companies, judges, uh, school districts. Uh, when they have control, they really corrupt the entire community, and so it's a real problem. I agree with your analysis on that because you, you've focused on this issue more than I have, obviously. But in a way, isn't it good to be right up underneath the enemy? Maybe that's the spot they never look. Maybe they're not going to let stuff get too out of control there. Well, I just feel uncomfortable myself just because uh, of their ability to come out of the bunkers and start to dictate to local government. And we're depending in this this theory of starting a revolution for liberty after a takedown is that we believe, at least I and a lot of other thinkers like Dr. Chuck Baldwin, believe that the Lord will create a remnant and basically inspire a lot of those remnants to seek safe places uh, further out to the West where they can have some freedom and establish some majorities to start to knit together libertarian No, I government. agree with you. So, so why build your, your remnant near the capital of the devil? I mean, because the globalists have said their new capital will be, in many of their writings, will be Denver. Yeah. And that's why I don't recommend that area at all. I encourage people to move out of that. West, Western Colorado is fine. The Montrose area is highly recommend, uh, recommended. Uh, but I still like uh, a lot of the communities, for example, where the Mormons are a majority because they're very conservative, even though they're not politically astute. In many regards, they are preparedness-oriented. And best yet, they have an alternative form of government so that if the state government collapses, they look to their bishops and their state presidents, and immediately they knit the government back together and have order. Uh, and they're not exclusive in their ability or willingness to help other people. Come. Why, so, are, why are Mormons uh, historically concerned about preparedness? Well, in the first place, because they came from a persecuted people. 
it's the federal government that drove them out. State governments drove them out of one state after another. And so they went eastward. They, they're the only religion in the United States that actually fought a war with the U.S. government and ground them to a standstill by burning their wagon trains and their supply trains across the plains until they had a negotiated peace. Uh, so deep in the Mormon heritage is a distrust of the federal government, a dislike of the federal government. And although many... Uh, of the Mormons are bending over backwards to try to accommodate government because they want them to be accepted. Still, the basic root philosophy of Mormonism is not one of trust of the world or trust of the government. And that's one of the reasons why they're prepared. Very interesting, because uh, I know I have a lot of Mormon listeners. And I know a lot of people that are prepared are Mormons. I've, I've seen that, but then I see a disconnect between average Mormon people who seem to really know what's going on and then the leadership, like Orrin Hatch, Mitt Romney, uh, and, and then people are like, well, that's a Mormon attempt to then infiltrate, you know, and try to change the government from within, but I don't think you're going to change this system. No, I don't either, and I think there's a, a naive feeling that uh, you can take back government by getting and by compromising with the establishment, making friends with the establishment. I don't agree with that philosophy, and um, many Mormons don't either. All right, continuing in the 20 minutes we've got, I appreciate all this time, uh, Joel. I'm inviting you to town so we can do a larger presentation because this book is so well done. Again, available at Infowars.com. Hope everybody gets it. It's a must read, a treasure trove of easy to access, well researched documentation. Uh, but continue with other areas that are important. One of the most important areas in the book which people really enjoy is where I give. Uh, specific examples of every metro area in the state. In other words, when you go to the state analysis, state by state, I give specific analysis. If you're living around New York City or New Jersey or Los Angeles Basin or Denver, Colorado, where to pick places to live on the periphery in suburbia that gives you the best chance of getting out of Dodge should uh, everything start to go down. And that's very, very helpful to people uh, to be able to have specific recommendations because I'm I use, I've been at this for 40 years, Alex, of designing high security residence and retreats for people. I've consulted with people for that long on how to find safe places. So I've got a trained eye of how to see things about where you know, relative safety is, is lied. I'm not an absolutist in the sense that you're either a perfectly safe place or you're lost. I believe in helping people where I can because I think that there's going to be a remnant that's going to escape the problems of the world. They're going to escape because they've made wide dis wise decisions, they've made contingency plans, they haven't put all their eggs in one basket. And even those who can't afford it, because a lot of our people in our movement aren't people of money or wealth, they can do a lot, whether they've got an apartment, whether they team together with friends, pick a friend or a relative in another smaller town that's safer, and make arrangements. I spend some time talking about how you plan to get there with your vehicle, how to prepare a vehicle so that you can get there, how to store food, how to, uh, and a lot of that, you know, is in my books, The Secure Home, on developing an actual survival residence or retreat. I still give enough of that in strategic relocation that people uh, can really move ahead with preparing what they need to do. One of the ways to prepare, if, and this is for people who have to stay within a major metro area, or at least in a portion of that, because of job, they need to make some minimum survival preparations of the uh, suburban residents that they have. If they can move, for example, and pick a place that's got a, um, a half an acre lot, for example, so that they can grow a decent sized garden, so that they can have a few chickens, that's a benefit. They need to pick homes that have basements in them. Basements provide you the ability, one, to store things in private, to put concealment in uh, that is not you're not capable or not as easy to conceal if you're an above ground, ground structure. I like to see people um, even remodel, add a basement if they don't have uh, basements in an area, add a basement under a remodeling. If there isn't a normal basement in the house, it can actually be advantage to do a basement under a new addition because no one expects there to be any basement at all if there isn't one under the main house. All of this goes towards helping people understand that if you are in a major metropolitan area, you may have to wait it out. If you don't get out in time, the worst thing you can do is try to jump on the freeway once it's already clogged or when it's imminently going to get clogged. 
it's better to sit back and wait for things to clear out a little bit and then come out a couple of weeks later. So I recommend that everybody who's got a contingency plan for getting out of Dodge also prepare to stay two weeks closed up and concealed in hidden storage or hidden areas within their own home. Sure, let me add this caveat. Uh, a lot of people rely too much on guns, but then others don't rely on them at all. If you've got firearms, A, you better have ammo, a lot of it, and B, you better know how to use that firearm. So I think so many people buying three, four, five, six million guns a month now, all-time record, they're not getting training. And it's, it, the number one issue with a gun is get the training and also think out what are your rules of engagement? When do you use it? And there's also a point about how to conceal it. Um, and I believe, and I talk, talked about this in my World Affairs briefing a couple of uh, weeks ago when we talked about uh, Obama's executive order on uh, commandeering national resources. It's based upon the National Production Act of 1950, which, as I said, uh, repealed the right to commandeer things. That has to be redone if they're going to implement that executive order. But still in the National Production Act of 1950 is a section which outlaws hoarding. And it's still on the books today. It's still valid today. You can be fined uh, $1,000 a day or something for hoarding anything that the government says is a scarce resource. And it mentions things relative to residences as well. It's not just industrial materials. And so if they declare food a scarce resource, you can be prosecuted for having food storage. And it doesn't matter to the government if you had it 10 years ago. If you got it when they declared a scarce resource, it can be confiscated and you can be fined or imprisoned for it. And that's why I say it's absolutely essential that if you have food storage, you must prepare to put it away in concealed storage. There's also a strategy involved in this. If you've got a mob coming down the street, you're not going to be able to avoid it. You don't want to shoot good people just because they're, they're desperate. Um, I will. You, well, what I'm saying is it, it's, it's unproductive if it's too big to, to overcome. Sure. No, I might... understand. So you, let me guess. You're about to say have a few guns, some dummy food to give them. Or not even the guns. What I'm saying, you have a few food left on the shelves. You open your door. You don't lock it so they don't have to break it down. You get into your secure storage that's concealed, and you disappear. They come in and take the food, and when it's gone, they go, to, they go somewhere else. Now, that's a wise strategy, you see, for surviving to live another day, and they don't get your real food storage. And if the government comes in to inventory food and take from people who are stored in you know, a forethought, they don't get your food because it's concealed. Joel, we've gone over an hour and 20 minutes here. So much incredible information. We'll obviously have to do another interview or maybe even get you in town here. Uh, I brought a lot of points up. It's been amazing. Uh, you know, all the issues you've covered here. You've done a great job answering all my questions. Uh, in the 10 minutes we've got left here on InfoWars Nightly News, what are other important areas you think we should cover? I mean, obviously, people need to get the book right now at InfoWars.com. They can also call 888-253-3139 during work hours uh, to get it. Um, but, but what do people, you know, out there who have no knowledge, what else can they do to get started? I mean, I think that's my message is, shouldn't they just get started investigating? Well, they do need information and knowledge. Um, and my book covers so much territory, and there's a lot more that has to be done relative to securing their home once they get into a safe location. Uh, but in this last 10 minutes, let me give people some general guidelines of where to go in, in, the, in the six different regions of the United States where they have the best uh, chance of finding safety and what the liabilities of each of those recommendations are. Let's take the Northeast first. The Northeast, you've got choices of uh, going north and west. And west is a problem because you've got the Appalachian Mountains. Now, a lot of people feel like you can go north into New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. And one caveat about that, even though that has some very real possibilities, those have cold winters, they have a lot of bugs in the summertime, which you have to learn to deal with. And you've got to deal with the Boston crowd, which is going to prepare to go north as well. And so getting from any of those East Coast regions up to the north, you have to transit all of these population corridors. But let's suppose you have a retreat out there. Just remember, as a caveat, that once 
they start, the crowds and refugees start to leave the New York, Boston area and flow west, you're cut off. In other words, you can't ever get back further west if you've chosen to go northeast, you're going to have to stick it out there. Uh, one of the other options, of course, for people in that northeast area is to go to northern Pennsylvania. That's probably the most unpopulated area in the northeast, even more so than upstate New York. Above Interstate 80 is what I'm talking about. Hardly any towns, almost all rural land, growable land. I don't know why it's never developed, but it's very an excellent position. From the southeast, uh, in the Carolinas or Georgia, People want to head toward the mountains, the Blue Mountains down there, the southern chain of the Appalachian is the best retreat area. But it will tend to get a little bit overcrowded as all of the people retreating to mountains from the southeast as well as Florida will end up towards the front range of the Blue Ridge Mountains or southern Appalachians. So the even higher, my highest rated area is what's called the... the um, Cumberland Plateau, and this is in southern Kentucky down through western Tennessee, I'm sorry, eastern Tennessee. The Cumberland Plateau is a thousand foot high plateau that um, most of the people live in the valleys around this plateau. There's very few population up above, but it's forested, it has good growing capability. Generally speaking, when people are retreating and come through the Appalachian Mountains into Tennessee and the farmland and the valleys, they'll look at these thousand foot escarpments leading up to the plateau and say, no, I don't want to climb that. And that's why I think that in the East Coast, the, the highest safety rating goes to that Cumberland Plateau area, and that's generally north of Chattanooga, Tennessee. We do have to watch for the Knoxville area, which is east of the plateau, because that's got a major nuclear target there, as well as government underground infrastructure in that area. Uh, when it comes to uh, Ar Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas, the Ozarks area in northern Arkansas and southern Missouri are the pre uh, preferred areas for retreating in, in, in that part of the land. I was about to, uh, well, an hour ago, bring that up. We have government facilities posing as civilian homes there in the Ozarks. That's even been in the news. These giant armored castles they're building with underground connections and things. That's actually, you know, m made it into the news. All these billionaires right in that area of the Ozarks digging in. That's right. Um, these are people who have had government connections. I don't think most of them, or but a very few of them, might be actual direct government, you know, dark side operators. That the type that are moving to Colorado. But you're right. Uh, some very unfortunate, unwise, wealthy people have built some castles there that are just so high profile. I don't think they have a prayer of surviving because they're too high profile. It's an unwise strategy. They're building classical castles. Uh, no. What's wrong with the with the castle defense? Well, you can always roll up a bigger tank. That's the problem. Uh, anytime you have a fixed fortress mentality, you're dealing with a government that eventually will get to you if you tight if you resist. It's okay, you know, for uh, against people. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, the government's going to be the problem. So the answer is don't get noticed. That's right. Stay low profile. And uh, it's, no matter how much money you have, it's better to spread that money into multiple uh, eggs and multiple baskets rather than try to make a huge fortress that is obvious, something that everyone for 100 miles around is going to know about. Well, that's what my instinct has told me is that I live in close to Austin, but try to buy this inexpensive shack you know, 100 miles in the absolute cruddiest area possible and just have an underground, you know, stored food there and basic necessities. And that's what I'm looking at right now, just absolutely middle of nowhere. And it's important when you live near a nuclear target, there are certain cities, about 15 or 16 cities I've uh, identified in, in their targeting maps in strategic relocation. When you live or have to live in those, it's important to relocate to behind a mountainside uh, in that area so that you're not in that visible radiation map of a nuclear weapon going off. Um, is that why Texas is so bad? Is that so many military bases? I mean, I live in Austin, Texas. Well, I live outside Austin now. I mean, just, just a general selfish question. What would you do if you lived in central Texas? 
Well, I would get west uh, into the hill country. Uh, there are no military bases other than San Antonio, so you need to steer clear of that. Um, but I think the hill country uh, farther west. Uh, sure, I noticed in your book you speak well of the hill country. That's where I live, is, is, is away from San Antonio but out to the west. That's right. And that's the preferred place. It's close enough to commute, and yet it's got enough hills to give you shielding. And uh, there is water underground there, so I think it's, it's survivable. How did you do all this research? I mean, the U.S. is so giant. I live there, and you even know about that area. It's a tiny area. Well, as I say, I've designed homes all over the United States for the last 40 years, and so when you get into those areas and you stay and you supervise construction, you get to know the area. But, but again, I've got a little place right outside town, only 25 miles or so. My gut tells me, well, perhaps you can privately consult for me of where maybe even 50, 100 miles out, I can have a real place to go hide out at if everything collapses. Yeah, definitely a person as high profile as you are, Alex, needs to have um, multiple retreats. Because I've had the debate with my wife. You know, she grew up all over the world. Her dad was a diplomat. And she goes, I've seen tyranny. I've, I've studied it. Uh, and uh, you know, she also took political science. And she's like, should we get out of here? And I'm like, look, as high profile as we are, stand and fight. And I've sold her on that idea. But plus, it's the right thing to do. But at the same time, if I'm cut off communications-wise and can't be on the air or the Internet, there's no point. I've got to then disappear. Well, that's right. And at some point, I'm afraid for a period of time, all of us activists are going to have to disappear. But I think there's ways to prepare in advance to be able to get some word out, to give some direction, to give some leadership to uh, where people ought to be going, to coalescing. And I think we have to prepare in advance for that. And that's not only a safe location, but that uh, has to do with safe communications and alternative communications. Now, that's what I'm doing now is learning how to use shortwave transmitters and then, and then have people that are ready to get the message. I mean, I want, I'm, I want listeners to understand something. I'm really preparing. I mean, I really believe this. People are like, oh, you just want to sell some preparedness book. I hope that we fix things and it doesn't go where it's going, but I hope we wouldn't get Obamacare. I hope the TSA wouldn't be at highway checkpoints. I mean, I saw them on C-SPAN 10 years ago lay out their plan. That's what's so frustrating, Joel, is so much of this is out in the open to those of us that research, and then the general public just says, oh, none of it's true. They have no idea how real this is. One of the problems that I have to deal with all the time is nobody believes <clears throat> that there's an ulterior evil agenda involved with that. They believe the terrorism excuses, and I have to go to great lengths to try to give them examples of how Terrorism has been created, that the terrorism prosecutions have been because of agent provocateurs hired by government to go in and give them the weapons, to talk them into using them, to cajole them, to twist their arms, to bribe them. Uh, without that knowledge, which the mainstream media does not give them, they're incapable of coming to the conclusion. And to some extent, they're guilty of having and not listening to conscience. I believe that everybody who really is an astute listener to conscience is going to get nervous feelings about where this country's going, about the excuses government gives. They're going to suspect that something's wrong. And if they don't suspect, I don't know if we can help them. What, well, exactly. I mean, if you're not noticing what's happening now, something is fundamentally wrong with you. Uh, I mean, the bedrock tyranny of TSA announcing all over the country they have plain clothes, uh, undercover people listening to our conversations. Isn't that a desperate gambit to just l scare us that, ooh, you're being listened to? Or getting us used to it. Yeah. And I think that was the reason why they leaked, the government leaked to the press some of their uh, illicit uh, uh, transcripts so that they could come up with a congressional solution that would give government partial power. And with that partial power, they can hide even more illicit surveillance. I mean, they're surveilling everything. They have been ever since Obama sure. created. Uh, you know that. But uh, I think that there's, this is a matter of leaking to the press mistakes that we make, getting Congress to give us permission to overcome it. And then we just keep building this tyranny system. And we mustn't make the mistake of thinking because they're building the structure that it's imminent. Because if we cry wolf too often that it's imminent, it's next month, you know, all the time you have somebody saying that somebody was a Christian, heard uh, he was part of the National Guard, and he heard that they're going to take over next month. We've got to be careful of those kinds of disinformation things. Because I think we mustn't discredit 
the fact that it really is going to happen someday by those that are crying the sky is falling too early. I agree Thank with you. you. I and, and, but I mean, I mean, at so many levels, at so many levels, the system has taken over, but the massive purging isn't here yet. And 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 you know, Joel, I happen to really not just know, I understand. People speaking out have actually slowed it down as well. They have. I agree with that. They have become more concerned that this is getting. And, and frankly, I have to admit, you have you have had the widest influence in this nation on alerting to people on a broad range of subjects of conspiracy that is believable, and uh, that's concerned uh, the establishment. It has slowed them down. They have to be more careful when this information is getting out there. Yeah, I mean, watching my own show or watching my own radio show, listening to it, it, it's quite a spectacle of hysteria sometimes. But I think the fact that I am genuine and real of spirit, that telegraphs to people. So for all my faults, God has used what I've done towards good. And uh, but, but undoubtedly, we're reaching 15 million people conservatively a week now. And uh, I have my employees being followed to work now by the government. Harassment's increasing. But I only take that as a fact that we are having an effect. Joel, we're going to have to do another interview in depth. And things are quickening. Uh, so we have to you know, do it in the near future. But in closing, since you mentioned it, spend a few minutes on basic home defense and preparedness. Because once you've picked your place, your book also gets into ways to fortify it, protect it, uh, spend a few minutes on that. Well, that is my specialty, is how to fortify a home and not make it look like a fortress. And uh, essential to that, as I mentioned before, is having underground space. I do not recommend underground homes, per se. The resale value is abysmal. There have been underground homes that have been beautifully lavish, designed million, million dollar homes that have been on the market for years and they can't find a buyer. It's just not wise. You say, I'm not going to plan to move, but people do have to make changes. So I recommend building conventional structures above an extensive basement space so that the basement is, some of it may be visible and some of it invisible. I think it's important in designing a structure that you don't put any equipment that has to be, that you can't personally maintain into that secure part of the basement. You've got to have an open mechanical room where that stuff can be maintained. Otherwise you end up opening your secure door and letting in workmen, which compromises your security arrangements. It's also important to have alternate energy equipment. And this has the range of uh, multiple uh, fuels for heating the home, multiple fuels for heating water. Water, I've done several tests with my family on living under survival conditions. And it's extremely important under the stress of living in less than optimal conditions, closed conditions in an underground shelter to have hot water. It's a very soothing thing. So having a a solar hot water system or using excess solar energy from your solar panels once the batteries are charged to heat hot water. It's a little difficult to do electronically, but we know how to do that, and that's important to do. Having some way to secure windows and doors. I have a strategy, for example, where the homes that we design or the ones that we remodel, we harden that master bedroom door and jam so that nobody can burst into that bedroom, even if they gain access to your house. We try to design houses, for example, where the children can get to the master bedroom without having to go through the main stairway or the main hallway. Then from that master bedroom, they can get downstairs into a shelter system without having to once again come out of the master bedroom into the hallway where an intruder might be. These are the kinds of strategies that are important in designing a home or remodeling a home that really make a difference between a home that doesn't operate in a crisis and one that does. Obviously, we try to integrate in generating facilities, uh, and I, I like to make sure that generators don't run constantly. problem with automatic generator transfer switches is once they turn on, the generator keeps running whether you're using electricity, electricity or not, and it uses a lot of fuel. So we like to design systems so that you can shut down that generator once it starts and use it twice a day to charge things up, use a battery bank or a solar system for the small electricity between those times. Those are the kinds of things that allow you to live off the grid without the $100,000 that it normally takes for an off the grid home. In other words, using minimum off the grid techniques rather than trying to spend a whopping amount of money to have total off the grid homes. So we use electricity while we've got it. We're prepared to run at a minimal level once that electricity is gone and uh, with multi-fuel uh, 
contingency for operating the various systems of the house. We also deal a lot with window security as well. Uh, if you have strong doors, metal doors and metal jams on the outside, you need to look to the windows, the weak link. Um, and there's a multiplicity of window treatments. They are rather difficult, expensive to do some of them, but at least we can use polycarbonate acrylic sheeting on windows to stop vandalism from happening. We can prepare with mylar sheeting to uh, cover broken windows if they get broken during the window uh, during the winter time when you might lose all of your heat. And we also have designs for gravel wall construction, for example, a very economical way to make bulletproofing of walls an alternative. It's not so much that you're trying to make the home a fortress, but sometimes if people take pot shots at you if they're resentful of you having electricity and they don't. It's nice to have walls that you can actually hide behind and feel safe behind than, than the typical wood frame wall of which bullets pass right through. You know, you see all those movies about cowboys and Indians and people hiding behind the walls in a gunfight. Well, it just doesn't work in reality. No, it certainly doesn't. And, and, and there will be those type of issues. But unlike other societies have, that have collapsed, we have so many people that are armed uh, it's 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 if things do collapse, it's going to be so explosive. It will both for good and for evil. Uh, and I happen to think that because so many people are not prepared, even good people are going to have to take the streets to survive. And that's why I say we need the contingency planning, of being able to get out of harm's way, get out of confrontation way, so that we're not having to confront well-meaning good people who didn't prepare who frankly just want to take your food. And if you share all of your food with everybody that comes along, you'll be hitting the streets just like they will as unprepared within a day because it just takes that long to share your food. So you have to be a little hard-nosed about the fact that you can't share everything. Well, look, that's my point. I've warned people, I've talked about it, and my kids come first. And so there's not going to be a bunch of charity if this stuff actually implodes like this. Folks signed on to the New World Order. They laughed at us. That's their problem. Uh, right now is my charity trying to wake them up and warn them. And I feel the same way. It's not that we don't want to help, but that you can't be true to your family and your preparations and give to everyone who hasn't prepared. People have to take the consequences for their lack of feeling that there's a problem and lack of sense. The information's there. You and I have been on the air for years, Alex. The information's out there, and people need to take responsibility well, for what they know. Sure, I've learned in business, though, in most cases, if you give people things, instead of them even appreciating it, they think it's owed. So my, my problem is if I give neighbors something, then they're going to come back and say, now I demand more. So, I mean, I've seen that weird human psychology. It's very bizarre. Well, I think in the, in the future crises, it will make some people better. It will make a lot of people worse. And like World War II, it's not going to be easy to live through. But I believe that we'll get divine assistance if we do our part in helping and try to warn others. And I appreciate what you've done, Alex. Well said. Yeah, the evil forces have the devil. We have God. Folks, the book is Strategic Relocation. It is the best book out there. Real knowledge, deep research. I mean, the Texas Hill Country is a tiny area outside Austin, and he knows all about that because the info I read in the book it was very accurate. For my own research, before I'd even read his book, I decided five years ago to move out there. And then a couple of years ago, I finally read the book, uh, you know, the second edition. I was like, wow, this is really good information. It's available at Infowars.com. And Joel, let's have you to town to do another big report uh, in depth. Thank you for spending so much time with us. I hope viewers out there get this video out to everyone they know. Joel Skousen of World Affairs Brief, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this extended two-hour-plus transmission of Infowars Nightly News. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. I hope we're wrong about all this, but unfortunately, something tells me we're not wrong about it. So please get ready and prepare today. And the good Lord willing, we'll see you back here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock Central.